pathogenesis of OHSs, that is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. As the name suggests, in this syndrome, there are multiple ovarian follicles which are formed at the same given point of time. It occurs usually iatrogenically whenever we are doing ovulation induction for a patient of infertility. But it does not occur with all patients of ovulation induction. It mainly occurs with some drugs and in women who are at a higher risk factor. For example, it occurs in women who are receiving higher doses of GnRH analogs, usually the injectables, as a mode of ovulation induction. And it is also known to occur with the drug clomiphene citrate. But it is very unlikely to occur with the drug letrozole. So letrozole has lesser chances of uh, having OHSs as an adverse effect than clomiphene citrate. Now, who are the women who are at risk for this OHSs? Firstly, very young women or with a low BMI. But the most important risk factor, two important risk factors are the kind of ovulation drugs, induction drugs which we are using. And if there is previous history of OHSs, then it is more likely to occur. Other risk factors are already if the woman is having higher antral follicular count. Already there is high count. On top of that, we are giving ovulation induction drug. Then it will trigger OHSs. And the risk factor is the presence of PCOS. So all these risk factors combined with the kind of drug which we are using for ovulation induction makes a woman a liability for developing OHSs. Now, coming to the pathogenesis of the disease, what happens in it? In the women who are at a higher risk factor, in those women, this disease mainly presents because of two important hormones. This is estrogen and human chorionic gonadotropin, that is HCG. The women which are, who are at a higher risk are usually at a higher level of beta HCG in the serum. This combining with the high levels of estrogen because of pre-existing condition, it leads to the genetic expression or a higher expression of a gene called the CFTR gene. This is nothing but the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene. Once this starts getting expressed at a higher range, there will be a lot of epithelial membrane proteins which are expressed. These proteins are expressed at a higher percentage in the women who are having the CFTR gene mutation or it's higher expression of the CFTR gene leads to higher expression of epithelial membrane proteins. And what does this epithelial membrane protein do? It leads to the expression of, it leads to a kind of fluid shift from intravascular to extravascular space. All the fluid shift from the intracellular compartment goes into the extracellular compartment. And once this happens, the woman presents with a lot of effusions. Where all can this fluid accumulate? Peripherally causing edema. In the peritoneal cavity causing ascites. And in the pleural cavity causing pleural effusion. And this happens at a very rapid rate. And because there is transmission of fluid from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment, we know that the intravascular space is compromised or the fluid in the intravascular space has become less. That is why the hematocrit of the patient rapidly rises because of hemoconcentration. Okay. And because of that, the sodium levels, but uh, there is electrolyte imbalance in these patients with respect to the sodium levels and the potassium levels. Why does this happen? This excess estrogen which is there, it rapidly activates the RAS, that is renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And once RAS is activated, it leads to sodium excretion and potassium retention. 
So sodium itself, potassium in, is in, and there's a lot of hemoconcentration which is occurring. This leads to hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Now, there's a lot of intravascular fluid which is going out. So there is there are features of hypotension which are occurring, or there is decreased fluid in the intravascular compartment, and this can present with pre-renal AKI because of hypoperfusion of the kidneys. Once the pre-renal AKI occurs, this leads to deranged RFTs leading to an increased creatinine values. So all the pathophysiology is regarding one particular gene expression that is the CFTR gene. Okay. Now, coming to how the patient presents. Okay. The patient mainly presents in two features. Depending on how much of electrolyte imbalance or how much of fuel shift is occurring, OHS case can be classified as mild, moderate, and severe. Why this classification doesn't change much of a difference? It's only for the management purpose. Patient presenting with mild features of mild pedal edema, little pain, abdomen, patient is not having electrolyte imbalance, patient looks stable, she can be managed on OPD basis. Analgesics, tell her about adequate fluid intake, tell her about the warning signs of pain, abdomen, breathlessness, rapid weight gain, and tell her to visit again if the electrolytes and the lab values are normal. For moderate and severe patients, manifestations of the disease, patients need to be admitted for monitoring of electrolytes, ascites, pleural effusion for further evaluation and if needed, surgical intervention only in case of torsion, rupture or hemorrhage. So, hope this video was useful. Thank you for watching.